Um, all right, I'll say a few very general words about kingship as opposed to kings, uh, and then I hope we shall have some two-way discussion about uh, that great document, Doomsday Book, that I hope you've all had time to read. Um, I'll talk firstly about kingship in an ideological sense, and then kingship in a practical sense, though uh, there are overlaps, connections between some of the points, some of the issues that we shall talk about here. For uh, kings in Europe, in the uh, Western Europe, in Christian uh, Europe in the Middle Ages, the main kind of ideological basis for uh, kingship was obviously religion. Um, and kings in one way or another were believed to have something special, something sacred or sacral uh, about them, okay, uh, that marked them out as different. Now we could treat, we can trace this back to uh, pagan ideas uh, of, of rulers and kings. We can see parallels going back before Christianity to some extent of uh, concepts of, of Roman emperors as gods or whatever and so on. So there's a long tradition uh, of this idea that kings are somehow rulers, leaders have got some uh, separate power as well. So we can trace it back uh, in one way or another, Germanic or, or, or whatever. Uh, but in addition, the church does play a very, very important role. Um, what, and this is particularly clear, we've looked at some examples of this as well, what uh, made uh, a king technically different from everyone else? What happened that made the king uh, different. Okay, a king is a man, but he becomes a king at some point. Now, what's the kind of transition point? What's the process that makes that person uh, different from what he had been before, or for you and me? Uh, and I can't decide between the two of you. Think. Yeah, well, ladies, for, well, Alp was more kind of. I'm thinking. I'm gonna have a go, but you seem more definite. Uh, well, as far as I understand, it's because king, kingship comes from the divine power. Kings have the divine the power is given by the god to the king. If I like. Yeah, well, of course, that becomes, uh, yeah, it, 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 some think is in the Middle Ages, but later on, of course, we get concept of divine right, kingship, and so on, that, uh, which, is, which, to some extent, takes its roots in all this. But uh, I'm saying more... Um, Yes, but a man is at one point just a prince, or even not a king, and not a member of the royal family. He becomes the king uh, because he's been fighting or whatever, and at what point, what makes him into the king? That's what I'm saying. Uh, okay, well, well, sorry ladies, but I, I was kind of thinking about it before. Well, uh, okay, well, yeah, we'll come back to that issue soon, but um, firstly, just crown, coronation, whatever, ordination, something like that. That's what I was after here. Now, do you want to add something? They managed to uh, size power as well. They, they, they were different than their rivals in terms of power. Okay, the practical side, yes. that, that's the thing there that makes them. But whether they are practical or not, and there's all these issues there, uh, to call this person king, or king, uh, he's, he's had to have been ordained in some way, okay? And uh, Jim, did you want to, what did you want to add to this, to that? Uh, I think my uh, thought will be practical. Right, okay, well we'll come to the practical issues now. We're talking at the moment about the theoretical, the ideological side, uh, okay, which uh, is just what exists in people's heads. So one of the main ideologies about kingship was this sacred character, okay, which in this context is, is Christianity rather than uh, pagan, Germanic, or Roman, or whatever. And the thing which marks the king off from others is this process of ordination. Whether he's inherited the kingship from his father, or whether he's someone who's basically won the kingship by killing everyone else, 
or because he's been elected like Conrad of Franconia, but he was a Duke before that, whatever, whatever the process that technically got him to that position where he can become king, to become called king, rex in Latin, okay, he has to go through this ordination process. And that's what brings us to what I think Alp was saying. Okay, you get various things. You receive the crown, some kind of. You have various other symbols of power. Uh, they can become more complicated later on. And very often you are also anointed with uh, holy oil or holy water and things like that. Again, something which then touches you. And at that point, you are perceived to be different from other people. This is the idea that develops more and more. That the process, it's not just an office, like becoming uh, assistant professor or library director or something like that. You are, at that point, also a different kind of person because you are the king and because the church has been involved in doing that. And of course, from a practical point of view, if you make someone king or queen, uh, there is a certain relationship between the ordained person, the ordainee, is that the right word, and the person who's doing the ordaining, the ordainer. And there is almost a sense of a hierarchical thing, because I'm making you into the king. Now, once you're king or queen or whatever, you have this power, theoretical and, and real. But to become king, you rely upon me. And this is the problem that guys like Charlemagne, and we still had it before with Otto, kind of don't never get escape from. And this is, to some extent, one of the things that leads to these big conflicts between the papacy and especially the Holy Roman Emperors, uh, uh, which we'll look at next week, which is who's the, who's the most important one here? Is it me, the Pope, because I'm the one that made you king, or is it you, the king or the emperor, because you are king and emperor? And it's one of these issues that goes back all the way, I suppose, in a sense, back to Constantine the Great and the fact that Christianity kind of developed in that way. That was Serkan's head, everyone there, if you notice. Um, so, but the ordination thing, in the case of kings, normal kings, it will be some kind of, it will be archbishop that does it rather than the pope, okay? But it's still an issue there. And what, how do these two parallel, to some extent, hierarchies relate? Uh, because again, if you're claiming to be a po politician, but the most important politician, but you have this sacred ideology, it's coming from the church, you, do, you need that as well. So this is overlapping with that. During this period, during the uh, central Middle Ages and even later, uh, in connection to this, um, we have uh, claims by many uh, dynasties and kings uh, that they had kind of sacred healing powers. Mark Bloch, Bloch, how we pronounce it, who wrote the, uh, one of these famous works on feudalism, feudal society, which many of you have, have been looking at because all the copies in the library are, are not currently on the shelves. He also wrote a slightly less well-known book called The Royal Touch, which actually examines, I think particularly with reference to the kings of France, this claim that they can cl uh, cure scrofula. It's some kind of skin disease. I don't want to go into the details of that. But it was believed that if you touched even kind of the clothes of the king of France, it would cure you of this uh, particularly nasty condition. And even into the early modern period, kings and queens in Europe uh, persisted in believing that somehow, because they were king or queen, they had this, this uh, I wouldn't say magical is the wrong word or whatever. Okay. And... Um, so health and even you know the kings uh, uh, could uh, uh, were therefore uh, good for the health of the country in a broader sense. I suppose it could be symbolic as well. One of the other big issues, and we can call it uh, ideological, but it kind of overlaps with practical to some extent, is uh, whether kingship is hereditary or not. Hereditary means passed on through uh, some kind of family connection. Um, if, and we look at very early uh, um, documents, for example, many, many weeks ago we were discussing Tacitus, it seems like a, an age ago since we were looking at Tacitus now, I think about it. But um, he talks there about you know mili that military leaders are chosen amongst the Germanic peoples for their for their skill for their ability to lead and win battles and it's those military leaders that are in a sense the direct or indirect predecessors uh, of the later kings and so on. Then obviously at one point you choose someone to be the king. You want someone to be the leader of your group, your country, because they will be good leaders and they will do various practical things that we'll look at in a minute. Okay, but on the other hand sort of against that, you have this 
inclination, this uh, habit amongst people, uh, whether it's with their possessions, but therefore also with their titles, to want to pass it on to their uh, own offspring, their, their sons usually as well. So uh, positions in power will become increasingly hereditary. I mean, uh, I know the situation in Syria, uh, Turkey's neighbor, okay, we have one president who was the son of the previous president. Is that really a president or just a kind of king with a different title? It's the, it's the same kind of inclination that we all have in a sense. We can't uh, disassociate our personal property with uh, something which is um, uh, really our responsibility or something like that. Um, but as we've seen in the uh, period we've been looking at, even in the previous hour, there were still other traditions going on. The older Germanic tradition of the, the great uh, men of the, uh, uh, of the country choosing or selecting uh, the king was still there. When uh, the Carolingian line kind of failed, it was the Dukes of Germany who more than once had to elect uh, the king and even Otto uh, the first was in fact technically elected again by the dukes uh, although he subsequently kind of got them under control and things became more markedly uh, hereditary after that and what um, is the technical word for the tendency which we have in most monarchies today though I think in Britain there we're now thinking about other things where normally you will give the kingship automatically to your oldest child and normally to your oldest son, of course, but the, uh, the concept that's based upon the eldest rather than the most able, which may be... Mm, uh, begins with p p p Almost, almost primo genitor, which means something like firstbornishness or something like that. Uh, and even in the Middle Ages, okay, uh, that was not, in the early Middle Ages, that was not automatic. You didn't automatically assume, Chok Yasha, that the, uh, the eldest and the eldest son would automatically become king, okay? Um, and uh, I mean, if we look at this, just to put one of my lovely diagrams up from earlier on that we were looking at, uh, okay, we had here Matilda, who claims that she can pass on the crown from her father uh, to her uh, son, uh, as against the claim of uh, Stephen, who was inheriting the crown from an earlier king through his mother and so on. I mean, who, uh, we're not going to sit around and sort of really sit down and say, well, actually, I think he's correct or he's not correct. You, you make up the rules. And we'll talk in a, a few weeks' time about the Hundred Years' War, when the King of England claims to be, through various uh, uh, connections and so on, the King of France, and again, again, all the legalistic things. And this is a kind of partly an ideological thing, uh, to, as well as a practical issue and so on. Uh, of course, at the end of the day, the one who... Uh, has the biggest sword, the one who can win more battles, is the one who will often uh, uh, press his claim uh, more effectively than the other guy. And um, uh, who had the, the best legal argument will uh, sometimes be accepted, will sometimes be ignored because uh, practical... Has that not gone off? I think it's going off. It's just... Sorry. Um, uh, the... Uh, the, clay, the claimant to uh, the crown through one way uh, may be ignored or, or just passed over because the, uh, the more successful military uh, person has won and so on. Right. right. Well, this is what this is. The, yeah. Well, seniority means the same kind of thing. I mean, it means someone who is senior, who is older. Uh, primogenitor uh, means first, primus in Latin, firstborn. So it's more specific. Okay. If you've got three brothers, then you could say he's senior to him, but he's senior to him. Okay. But in this case, we're just saying it's the oldest. Okay. Uh, and senior means older. It doesn't mean oldest. Okay, whereas primus means the first. So it's a bit more specific if I'm just etymologizing the words there. Or whatever. But in English, if we talk about a rule of giving 
uh, kingship or anything else to uh, the, the oldest, and usually the oldest son, then that is a, called a system of primogeniture. Yeah. Okay, practical issues which have overlapped here a little bit. Uh, again, Mark Bloch uh, in his uh, book on uh, feudalism, feudal society, uh, says that there are three fundamental duties of the king. He outlines that there are three fundamental things that kings should be doing. He said, firstly, they should be ensuring, preserving the spiritual salvation of the people. So that means they have, to some extent, a religious duty, though they are not in themselves religious uh, figures as such. They're not members of the ecclesiastical uh, hierarchy, technically. Secondly, to defend the people from external or foreign attack, which is obviously military in role, and then to maintain justice and order within the realm, to preserve people from attack, I suppose, internally from other people there. Yes, to maintain justice, to maintain fair rule of the law and order and justice between people. The duty of the king. He's the ultimately responsible for making sure that other people maintain these things. He's not responsible to each individual, okay, because he can't go around the whole country deciding each case, but he is responsible for making sure that a system exists and continues that will preserve religious salvation, military uh, <coughs> protection, uh, and injustice as well, in that sense. In that case, I have a problem because there is also, there is also a papal, papal courts which were in charge of... <sighs> yeah, well, ecclesiastical courts, we should say, more specifically, there were various kinds of courts in, okay, in, by the central Middle Ages, earlier on things were a bit more mixed, but in the, by the central Middle Ages, by the time of the 12th century and later, uh, you clearly have, um, as administration on all levels develops, you do have secular courts, and you have very, very local courts. Lords will have their own courts, so someone in his own land will be responsible for maintaining justice in his village or something like that, okay? And then you work that way all the way up to the king who has uh, his own court, of course, which will deal with very big issues. And parallel to that, again, you have ecclesiastical courts. Now, ecclesiastical courts, to a large extent, are responsible for, well, firstly, things done by members of the church. So if a clergyman has been naughty, then it's the ecclesiastical court that will punish him, or if a nun has been naughty, her or something. But also, there were certain things which were considered to be the work of, the, it's more religious in nature, okay? If someone is doing something uh, which goes outside of religious laws and religious expectations, then the court that will deal with that will usually be the ecclesiastical one. If you just steal someone's coffee or something like that, okay, uh, then in those cases it's going to be the local court, uh, the secular court, that will probably uh, punish me for that. It won't be the ecclesiastical court. They're looking after slightly different things. Maybe I have problems with technology, because when was the dictates of the Pope? Because I think, if I am right, one of those rules most probably in dictates of the Pope, it says that if there is a conflict and if you cannot get over with it, you should consult to uh, this ecclesiastical court instead of the king. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, we'll come, well we're, we're looking at those next week. The, uh, the dictatus we shall actually discuss next week. Uh, there's no answer to those questions. As we've said, constantly, because of the nature of uh, Western Christianity especially, where you have these two parallel hierarchies, you're always going to have the two hierarchies overlapping. Here the king is claiming to be sacred, to have some religious power, and that obviously is also a challenge. And exactly where the boundaries of different courts are will vary as well. Uh, these are talking about certain issues of a high, higher... Okay, lots of hands over here. We better... Um, okay, Ravel, let's go around that way. So, Ravel? Uh, also, like, um, at least according to like, the, the, the fundamental duties of the king, uh, it doesn't seem to me like uh, that would really present a problem for him because he could just say, well, I'm maintaining justice within my kingdom by making sure that the ecclesiastical courts are functioning and that people have access to them. I mean, it's not saying that he has to have secular courts. It's saying that he has to have justice within the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. The only pro yeah, Fair enough. That will be a good way of getting around it. The only problem is that in the Middle Ages, as to some extent today, because lawyers are very wealthy people, administrating justice was a good way of making money, okay? So if you've been naughty, 
if you've been naughty, you usually have to pay some kind of compensation. Now, uh, in the church courts, there may be some kind of fine, but often it was also some religious punishment or whatever and so on. But um, uh, maintaining justice, administering justice, was a very lucrative uh, way of making money. Okay? So kings and noblemen also wanted to extend the influence of their courts because it was a way of getting money to them. And meanwhile, the ecclesiastics, who were not stupid, wanted to preserve their rights and extend their rights because it was, it was a lucrative way of, of making money for their hierarchy as well. So there's no perfect answer to all this. Uh, at one point it will be this, at one point it will be that, and so on. And we will come back to all these issues uh, in a broader sense when we look at these arguments between the German kings, the uh, Holy Roman emperors, and the popes next week as well. Uh, okay, the next one was Alp, I think, and then we'll come to Serkan. So I just remember that they have a bunch of problems, for instance, concerning churchmen. Sometimes the king or nobleman wants them to be taken to a secular court, but the church tries to protect them and so on and so yeah. forth. On top of that, you get problems with respect to the appointment, oh, appointment of bishops and archbishops, yeah. the kings want to do it, they want to get them all, they want to get the right, and the church sometimes doesn't want to yeah. get the right. And so on and so on. Yeah, okay, so we'll, th these issues we will come to next week, because this is the whole, uh, that's the main focus of next week's topic. I Sorry? I just it, thought of it, and now you said all those stuff. But, but I had, it had to come out, otherwise you would have had a stomach I, ulcer or something. In ordination, is that okay? Can I, I, well, let's first, if Serkan wanted to add something to this particular uh, I topic. I was going to say that, uh, like, if, if you want to look into the judicial <coughs> stuff, the courts of Britain is a great example of how justice within Europe, like, developed. Because you still have that archaic court system within within the United Kingdom. No? We don't call it archaic. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> as it's like, it's, it's been a development over centuries and centuries. It's not, it's an unbroken line of systems and systems. For example, here still, you could, today you could have Queen's Court where a high treason or, uh, you know, crimes such as high treason or big crimes would be tried and you would, within the Privy Council, you would have Lord Chancellor and Lord Justice actually. He was like the highest top person that people could petition before going to the King. Am, am I? Am yeah, I? something like that. I don't know the details oh, exactly and, today, but and yeah. You'd yeah. have Crown Courts and you'd have Magistrate Courts. Crown Courts are looking at, and you'd have, you have lay judges too, who are not professional judges. Do we? I don't know about yeah. that. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I know the professional it's, judges, but they're yeah, not okay. Professional judges. They're they're just you and me, like still. like the jury, but they're the judge. Yeah, still. Yeah, uh, you don't have the jury system in Turkey, do you? I don't think. No, no, no. no. It's kind of British and therefore American <coughs> thing, Anglo-Saxon thing. We say in a broader sense or whatever and so on. Which uh, my my father did once had to do jury duty, and it was a very boring thing about some guy speeding in his car or something like that. It wasn't one of these things where you know he was worrying about photographers trying to chase him around to find out what he thought and so on. But uh, um, yes, and we've all seen those American movies about that kind of thing. Uh, now, uh, okay. Fatty, you want to add something to this, or? I have a question about the, the justice stuff. Uh, in in uh, these times, uh, how the king uh, formed the laws? Uh, as uh, just as decrees, or uh, there's any uh, any uh, way to uh, form a law like today uh, in this parliament? Doing. Well, uh, yeah, at, at this time in the Central Middle Ages, you had various kinds of law. I mean, on the one hand, you had customary law, which were kind of understood rules that were perceived to be the customs of the people going back for a long time. But even since the very earliest Anglo-Saxon kings, even since the uh, first Anglo-Saxons to become Christian back in the post-Roman period, you had kings issuing sets of laws, some of which may just be codifying what was going on anyway, and some of which were addressing, addressing particular problems or whatever. It's like in Bill Kent, sometimes I live in the Lodge Man, and, uh, you know, I don't know, 
someone's left their uh, garbage bag in the wrong place and then the next day a little sign comes up please make sure you leave your garbage bag and it's kind of you know you, you just find a problem you, you make up a rule and stick it up there and everyone understands it then someone collects all those together and says these are the laws of Bill Kent University or something like that so it's probably a mix of these things but even very early on you had a tradition of kings promulgating uh, laws, whether it was their decisions or whether it was just kind of codifying existing patterns and so on. And these carry on throughout. Now into the uh, later part of what we're looking at, the later kings, back when we get to people like Edward I and, and later on, then we again begin to get uh, other people involved, particularly the parliaments begin to be involved in these things and statutes are issued in parliament, still technically coming from the king, but the parliaments are getting involved in those things as well. The bit we're looking at now a little bit earlier, so kings, some of these kings will issue laws which may be their decisions but also just kind of bringing together collections of things that they found from elsewhere as well, but they're seen to be kind of imposing their decisions, their law, upon the people, and copies will be made and sent round. Uh, then, uh, was there any class which helped the king, uh, helped king uh, about forming laws? For well, example, in uh, early medieval Britain, uh, there, there was the class of reforms. Uh, I mean, like that. By the Central Middle Ages, we begin, and we could have talked more about this today, um, and this could be something we can talk about now very briefly practical, but I need to keep an eye on the time so we don't lose Doomsday Book. Um, during the Central Middle Ages, we begin to get what is traditionally the king's household, the people and officers around the king in a fairly personal way, looking after his individual concerns as king and that household begins to move away from the king in some respects to looking after this, the country, the kingdom or whatever. Uh, so they become offices of state almost rather than just guys working with the king. And so for issuing laws, for writing up laws, for looking after finances, it's during the time of Henry I in England uh, and Henry II especially, and a similar kind of period or a bit later in France and elsewhere, that we begin to see something like a bureaucracy emerging and using written documents to record decisions, to record financial relationships. Some of these things and offices go back to Anglo-Saxon times and early medieval times. Some of them were kind of new. But the important thing is that they were moving away from the king as a personal thing, someone working for the king, and now it's the king as leader or as the head of state almost, that's a modern concept, and they were working as part of that bigger hierarchy, okay? Some of them move further away, some of them still part of the household or his court in that sense. So in terms of lawmaking, that's going on at this time, in a sense, more and more. Both. But you have both. You will have people who are noblemen and sometimes ecclesiastical noblemen who will be given these positions because of their skill or for other reasons. Uh, and then you have other people who actually just basically are uh, sitting in an office writing things out and so on as scribes and things like that. So it's a bit of both. Well, all of this was their political position, in a sense. Um, politically, if they were maintaining uh, the, the religious status quo and they were not being excommunicated or whatever by the Pope, if they were making sure that foreigners don't invade, and if they were making sure that people were treated nicely amongst each other, then that's essentially their political situation, and they were doing other things as well. But uh, that's a kind of sum of those plus extra, plus their personal and ideological side mixed in, in a sense. Now, time is going on very, very quickly, because um, you're asking me all these questions and so on, and Al wanted to say something about ordination, and you have precisely one minute. <laughs> When you, when you were talking about ordination, you, you referred to a certain hierarchy, or at least a question of hierarchy between those who ordain and those who are ordained. Not formal, just a kind of an assumed relationship. If I, make, if I give you a position, then there's kind of, automatically there's an assumption that I am somehow giving something to you, so therefore I am uh, a little bit superior and not in a technical sense, but in a, in a relationship sense. Say that the same issue occasions in others. Um, 
another question of hierarchy as, um, concerning concerning who can ordain or who will ordain. In the case of Britain or England, for instance, there are two archbishoprics, right? Canterbury and York. And it is the Archbishop of Canterbury, traditionally, who ordains, not the Archbishop of York. At some point, Henry II, he gets into trouble because Archbishop of Canterbury is away and <coughs> ordained by the Archbishop of York. And this is not, this cannot happen. This So a certain hierarchy also occurs or is occasioned by this ordination um, with respect to who can ordain this, some sort of order. So because the Archbishop of Canterbury can ordain the King of England, it, it is superior to the Archbishop of York. Yes, and there are cases where the king was not ordained, ordained by the Archbishop of Canterbury, as you say, and therefore then there is some comeback to him later on that you're not properly king and things like that, or whatever. So, uh, yes, that's the other side of that coin. Right, actually, uh, we'd better stop here, though there's plenty more to talk about, because I didn't want to get you to give me your thoughts about Doomsday Book. We have about 15 minutes left together, and uh, whereas I do want to say a few words by way of introduction. I'll try and keep those as short as possible. Um, Twenty years after he had won the Battle of Hastings at 1066 and uh, had fairly successfully imposed his rule over England and a little bit beyond, William the Conqueror decided to uh, find out Okay, more or less, what's the situation in this country now? He still had Normandy to worry about. He spent a lot of time in Normandy. But in 1086, uh, and this is according to one version of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle that was still being uh, copied and written up at that time, it says, After this, the king had important deliberations and exhaustive discussions with his council. Okay, again, who are these councillors? They are his personal advisers, but it's becoming a kind of position of state later on or whatever. About this land, how it was peopled, and what, by what sort of men. And ultimately, of course, he's concerned about what it's worth. That's the big thing. Then he sent his men all over England into every shire, and shire is the county, is the region uh, of uh, Britain still is today, to ascertain, to find out how many hundreds of hides of land, how much land, a hide is a measurement of land, uh, there were in each shire, and how much land and the livestock, animals, the king himself owned in the country, and what annual dues, taxes, were lawfully from each shire. He also had it recorded how much land his archbishops had and his diocesan bishops, his abbots and his earls, and though I may be going on in great detail, uh, and what or how much each man who was a landowner here in England had in land or in livestock and how much money it was worth. So very thoroughly did he have the inquiry carried out that there was not a single hide of land, not one vergate, not even, and it is shameful to record it, but it did not seem shameful for him, uh, not even one ox or one cow or one pig which escaped the notice of his survey. The surveys were all subsequently brought to him. Okay, and that's the uh, kind of uh, official recorded version of, of the sort of initiation of what becomes Doomsday Book. Um, now, I'm fairly certain that not every single cow or pig is in fact recorded in Doomsday Book. Um, that's uh, a slight exaggeration, or perhaps they've been uh, kind of missed out as the uh, versions were edited uh, and updated over time. And over the past kind of 10 years or so, there's been some argument about exactly what we have today and how that came about and when exactly. Uh, traditionally, we've seen everything that we have as happening more or less at the time of, uh, of William. And then uh, a scholar, a very fine scholar, David Roth, more recently been arguing that perhaps some of the manuscripts we have that we call Doomsday Book that uh, are down there in London still uh, may have actually been written up a little bit later and so on. But we won't worry too much about the finer details of their arguments now. But basically what they did is they said, OK, let's um, break up England into seven circuits. And they sent out guys who were responsible for each circuit. And each circuit had a number of shires in them. And then they went into each village 
and into the towns as well. And they went into everyone and said, OK, this bit of land here, who does it belong to? Who's your lord? What's it worth? How many cows? How many blah, blah, blah? OK, thank you very much. You, what have you got here? Da, 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 da. And they went round like that. And then they took them all back. Um, and they organized it shire by shire. Originally, it was done village by village and person by person kind of in the village and then when they edited it they tried to write it up in a different way and they organized it according to tenant in chief okay uh, a tenant is what what does that mean So, yeah, well, let, literally, tenant is one who is holding, okay, holding something, if you know it with your Latin. But here it's, so you're holding it from someone else, in a sense, okay. Remember what I said before, when William came along, he gave the land out, not the church land. The church is more or less kept most of their land, but the secular guys, and he said, okay, all the Anglo-Saxons have gone. I'm going to give you some, a bit of land here, a bit of land in that part of the country, and dot it all around. So what they then did was they organized uh, the book according to, okay, what does Earl Ravel hold? So then they said, well, he held a bit in that village and a bit in that village, and they all brought it together in that book, uh, in that part of the book and so on. And then they find the next tenant in chief, and they collected together all that he had. So what I gave you, I think, to have a read of was... Um, the first few pages of um, property held by Earl Roger in Staffordshire, wasn't it? Okay, uh, so just a collection there. And for example, the first one says Earl Roger holds uh, Claverley, twenty hides. Then he also holds Kings Nordley and Alverley, and so on. Okay, so it's the different villages that that he holds. Each shire was then written up, except the king died, we believe, and they never quite finished writing up these ones, so we have a different version of these guys. But the others were written up into something called Great Doomsday Book and organised according to the different tenants. So they said this, firstly the king was mentioned, then the bishops and the churchmen, and then the big lords, and the little guys get listed right at the end. Okay? And uh, the king has lands everywhere. Uh, his tenants in chief, which is the church and nobles, were then listed in that order. Okay? But ultimately, all the tenants in chief held their land from the king. It was that feudal relationship, lord and vassal. Okay? He has his domain land, he has the land that he is responsible for directly. He gets the, the food or whatever from that directly. Otherwise, he gets things indirectly from these guys because they, he's given it to them as vassals. But he can take it back if they're bad boys, okay, essentially. And occasionally, we also get mentioned people who actually look after the land underneath the tenant-in-chief. And we call these the sub-tenants. Uh, and I have to see if we have any of these. Uh, yes, so number five on your page, uh, in Cuttlestone 100, uh, Sheriff Hales, Reginald holds from him, okay? So the king is the ultimate <coughs> tenant, in a sense, holder. Roger is the tenant-in-chief. Reginald is here the subtenant. We don't always get these guys, but we can see some of these guys mentioned, and that's one example here. All right, what other stuff have we got recorded? What other information can you see coming out regularly from uh, this document? Because if we see things regularly, then we can put things together and we can see patterns and we can work out what's going on. One reference to Reginald doesn't mean very much. Fifteen references to Reginald begins to mean something to the historian. What other kinds of things uh, can you see coming out of here on a regular basis through these various entries for Earl Roger. Sweeps. Sorry? Sweeps. Um, where are the, yeah, okay, maybe quite some, a few quite a few slaves, number of slaves, okay. The value. Sorry? The value. The va yeah, well, at the bottom it says value, uh, T-R-E usually, tempore regis Edwardi in the time of 
uh, King Edward, which means before 1066, and then it says Modo, now. Okay? As I said before, I suspect the ultimate reason was to find out what it's all worth. What's this worth to us, boys? Okay? What is this English land? Oh, be a, what is this English land worth to us now? We have come here. And all this, you would say, is French accent or whatever. Is it, is it really been worthwhile being called King of England or whatever? Uh, and uh, you can see in some cases uh, the, uh, the manor, whatever it is, the village, the piece of land uh, is worth more than it was 20 years earlier. In some cases, it's gone down. So number one, the value was uh, seven pounds and ten shillings at the time of King Edward. Now it's worth ten pounds. So William will be happy about that, okay? Uh, or Roger in particular. Uh, but number two, King Nordsley, uh, King's Nordley, uh, it was worth eight pounds. Now it's worth half that. It's only worth four pounds. So that's gone down in value, taxable value. What money he can they can get out of this in one way or another? What else have we got here? What other things are coming up regularly? Plow. Sorry? Plow. Pl yeah, later on. Uh, um, okay, we've got things like mills, slaves, plows, and so on. So you can do an economic history. You can work out the structure of, of these villages by putting them together and so on. I don't know if they still do it, but it's interesting that they measure the amount of land that they have by how many plows can be used on it. Like land 432 plows. Right. I have no idea how much land that is. If it was in acres, I'd get it. Right, okay, well this is in hides, mostly. Hide is the measurement of land. Slightly smaller one was a vergate. Um, then what's the difference between 20 hides and land for 32 plows? I don't know. The, the hide is the actual physical measurement. Uh, and in terms of the plow, plow land, it may be that some of it is for plowing, some of it isn't for plowing, I suppose. It may be not something that you're not growing things on or whatever. Separately from village. Sorry? They there are three villagers, for instance, at number four, and then two free men. What is the difference between villagers and free men? Well, the, some of the villages may not be, well, they may be villains, they may not be free necessarily, it depends on the translation and so on. Uh, the various statuses, a free man is someone who was technically free, a villain was someone uh, who was tied to the land in one way or another, so was not necessarily a free man, could not go about what he wanted, he was the, the man of the Lord in a, in a very legal sense. Not a slave too. Not a slave, no, somewhere in between the two. Okay. Uh, we've technically run out of time. Um, which is a great shame, we're talking about justice and so on, uh, did for us. Um, we can see, for example, who held it before, uh, okay, who held the land before, so who had that before? Earl Algar was an Anglo-Saxon, Alfgar there, okay. Um, as I said, we get people like Reginald here. If we put this on a large scale, we look at Roger and we look at Reginald, we can work out their relationship in a feudal sense and whether they're connected, okay? We look at Algar here and we find out, is he regularly the person whose land has now gone to Roger or whatever? So we can work out the transition from the Anglo-Saxon times uh, to the current times. Uh, the economic stuff, the details of the natures of the villages are clearly there. So we can do economic history, we can look at social history by looking at villains as opposed to slaves and things like that with this on a massive scale. We can look at social political history in terms of feudal or whatever you want to call them relationships. We can look at the transition from the end of the Anglo-Saxon times to now and find out what's going on and what exactly did William do. When David said he gave Ravel land here, here and here and here, how exactly did that work and whose land was Ravel getting and what was going on and so on. Uh, when it mentions villagers and freemen and all of these people, is it talking about um, the entire population or is it talking about male like working people? It's going to be talking about male working people there. Three villagers. <laughs> Doesn't seem very... Well, yeah, but village is perhaps the wrong translation there, I think, as well. But there's all sorts of different terms for peasants in Doomsday Book and exactly what they mean and whether they mean the same thing in different places. But it's, it's analysing the sort of main members of that particular, and here we don't, this is a vill or a village or whatever, we don't necessarily, say this, this may be part of a village as well. There's this bit which I own and this bit which you own or, or hold and things like that. So it's not the whole part of it in a sense as one. Well. Claverly might occur more than once in, in Staffordshire Doomsday Book with different lords holding parts of it and things like that as well. Okay, very last question. 
the, va the value, I mean, the values of these things, the, 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 bit, the last bit, for instance, in each entry, what does it really mean? I mean, how, for instance, a value of a land or a house, anything today, we conceive it as, some, I mean, they did not have free market economy back then. What, was, <laughs> what did it mean? Did it mean, for instance, this, amount, this value, we could expect, this many soldiers to be raised from this farm. Well, it's kind of taxable. It is, it is kind of monetary at this point because it's the relationship between the big guys higher up. And it, it, yeah, it's pop, taxable kind of value in that sense. Yeah. All right, we better stop. Uh, time's running out. People have got buses to catch. Emra's probably running out of di disk space or something. So.